Hello again, everyone. We're back. It's episode 11. Yes, life is not deterministic. As you discover frequently, things just happen out of nowhere, right? Okay, we are back. What's going on? It's engineer week. Lots of pictures of uh, little kids roaming about. Little future engineers yesterday, right? Got some tour pictures from Dr. Vias's lab. It's always my favorite part of being department head is when somebody says they want to take a lab tour. And I said, well, I can show you uh, the headquarters of Vias Global Industries. And that's it. And they said, well, what are the other faculty? Where are their labs? I said, on a computer somewhere. And people just look at me. A while back, one of the deans I work for mentioned working together at the lab bench. And I looked at that individual and said, what are you talking about? And the oddest thing was they could not understand that there was no physical lab. Like they were figuring like Mullen and Sloan and all had some machine somewhere. Camera Diner has some kind. Not happening. Okay, today a brief look at probabilistic or stochastic demand and examples, comma, several. But first, uh, let's see, I got another, oddly enough, I got another inquiry from someone at Los Alamos looking for IEs to do a summer intern. So if you're interested, send me a note, I'll forward you the contact information. So they could be grad students or undergrads. They prefer someone who lives in northern New Mexico, but if you've been to Los Alamos, then you know there's not a lot of places to live that aren't already lived in. So, unusual. We run up and down with Los Alamos, actually. Because at different times, we've had a lot of students up there in the master's program, and they'd hire undergrads and other times. They're saying, we don't hire IEs. I said, okay, you don't now. You will again. And he said, I don't know anything about that. And, okay. But then people show up. So if you're interested, you do have to be a U.S. citizen to work there, as you have to be able to get yourself a security clearance at some point. So keep that in mind before you ask for the contact info, because I might say, wait a minute, they're not likely to hire you. I'll send it to you anyway, but they'll just tell you no. OK, so any event, let's see what's going on. We're in Chapter 5 of the textbook briefly, then we'll be on to chapter six. Assignment two is available. If you have questions, email them and I'll try to get to them on the fly as I roam about. Um, what we might want to think about is the examples I work so far and the stuff you, in theory, have read. It's a good theory, right? OK, excellent. That's an audience feedback I find a little unnerving, but OK. In theory, everything worked, right? Nobody was late. Nobody didn't show up because it snowed, that kind of thing. Of course, we're in southern New Mexico. It was 80-something degrees yesterday, right? Not much worry about snow, but you get the idea. So now we're going to think 
for a short time about probability issues. So essentially, the people who manage inventory for you, if that's you or some them somewhere, ideally they're getting money and spending it to support production. Ideally. And in theory, they're spending it wisely, not foolishly. So they're paying attention to key parts, right, A, B, C. They have safety stock for things that put you at a lot of risk. Inventory control technology does help a lot. It is, oddly enough, the source of a lot of great and not so great movies, I say. One of the things I find most interesting about engineering is how much uh, things can be taken as a movie theme. Shortages create great movie plots, right? What could be better than having somebody doing what? Augmenting inventory illegally. There was a movie with Nicolas Cage some time ago. It shows up on uh, TBS and Spike type networks every so often where he has to steal X number of cars. It's an inventory problem. As to whether we advocate theft, of course we don't, but essentially shortage. Um, most movies that have to do with uh, the illegal drug business are essentially inventory control problems. Somebody has it and somebody else wants it. And what does it cost? Now. The problem, of course, is it's fun to think about the movie. It's not fun to try and put that in real life. But realistically, technology helps a lot because you can maintain inventory better in the real world. Forget the movies. Barcodes, all that kind of thing can help a lot. Actually, um, let's see, last semester when I was stuck on a plane, I got to see a show I had never seen before called Superstore. I don't watch that much network TV these days. And that was a big inventory kind of thing, too. Having the right people in the right place is important, and so forth. Okay, so safety stock we talked about. What if demand and lead time were random variables is the problem. So if demand exceeds the reorder point, then you're going to hit a stock out. Right? Like, imagine if you will, you're running a party. You decide to stock the party with six cases of Diet Coke. Everyone who comes to the party decides to drink Diet Coke. If the demand exceeds six cases, you send someone down to the local mini mart, right? That's the restocking time. Now, all of us have been to parties, and I would imagine most of us have been to one where some key item, which we have coded Dr. Diet Coke, right, runs out. 
correct? And somebody goes on a run down to the mini mart, right? Next party, safety stock. Maybe buy an extra case. Now, obviously, that isn't how it works in real life exactly, but it might it might be exactly the party you went to last weekend, right? For all I know. But more seriously, what does the Raytheon or Dell or somebody like that do? They can't just send someone down to the local mini mart, right? They have a different kind of lead time problem, right? A lot of this stuff comes from where? the Asian continent somewhere, correct. It gets put on a truck. The truck goes to a port. The container gets lifted off, stuck on a ship. Eventually, the ship hits somewhere. For example, Long Beach, California, Seattle, Washington, and then the truck gets reassembled, or it gets put on a train, and then it goes on a truck, and it goes to the factory eventually. That's a 14 to 18 day process. What could create a lead time problem? Well, it's the winter. The North Pacific is not the safest place for ships. So people in the OR business actually team up with meteorologists to figure out how to route ships across the ocean. But we could have a stock out while we're waiting for the thing to get to Long Beach, right? Now, if, for example, I went to a party last semester where at the end of the party there was some amount of beer left over. The host of the party didn't drink beer. He was desperately giving it away. He didn't have a stock out problem. But if you think about inventory, we hit a reorder point, and in theory, we restock. If we run out, we're out of stock until a certain day. Recently, I tried to order something online, and I discovered it was out of stock until I don't know, February 25th. That particular vendor didn't do back orders. They just said, come back on the 25th and maybe we'll have it. I bought something else. Now, to you, that sounds like kind of a cute story that seems pretty obvious, right? But if this is your company, all the people who are demanding your product in this time period, you're not making a sale. Alternatively, if your demand pattern actually looks like that, and you reorder, you actually have this much to use up, don't you? Which becomes a problem if you have things like shelf life and also you spent money on those parts. That's money you can't use on something else. So the result of this is, of course, lots of people have tried to model it statistically. 
But fundamentally, the concept's really straightforward. If you don't have the stuff, the people can't buy it. You could, A, come up with what's called a back order system, which costs money, right? You gotta run it, gotta maintain it, and so forth. And B, what's the other problem with this? If you order too much for some reason, because demand varies and is less, you've paid for inventory that you can't sell. Also not good. Okay, so in the interest of showing some ways people attack it, the classic problem was originally called the newsboy problem. Of course, today we're, um, we've updated our uh, terminology and we're now calling it the news vendor model, which sounds sort of, I don't know, news vendor sounds a little off. News person? Yeah. Okay, any event. So our news person, their problem is they have to buy newspapers and then sell them, right? And you have to picture a world in which the news problem was invented. This will surprise you, but in the days when they had printed newspapers, Right, you see an old movie, you see the kid on the street with the bag, paper mister. The kids had to pay for the papers, right? And how long does the paper last? Well, it turned out that some of the major newspapers could print two, three, six editions a day. And you thought only the web updated constantly, right? They were doing it. So these kids had to buy the papers, and then the papers would go obsolete quickly. The shelf life on them was, say, three hours max. And there was a cost associated with overbuying, and a cost of underbuying. Now, if this is your money, you'd want to underbuy, right? Because you'd never want to buy papers that went obsolete. Unfortunately, underbuying leads to people buying papers from someone else. Also bad. So essentially, we could estimate a probability distribution of sales and then act accordingly. So if, say, for example, um, you happen to catch uh, Pearl Harbor with uh, Affleck and uh, Kate Beckinsale, right? The attack happens, lots of papers get sold. The day before the attack, nobody was buying them quite at the same intensity, right? So that's where you could see sort of the probability distribution thing happening. So what people did was evolve a model based on the cost of overbuy and underbuy. And so we had a cost of overbuy, which is the acquisition cost. And for some things, you can actually get rid of them. OK, now you see this on a daily basis if you drive past a Marshalls or TJ Maxx. 
or buy stuff from Sierra Trading Post online. The company, say like you're buying, I don't know, some Ralph Lauren polo. All right. If you go over to Dillard's, they're, I don't know, $79. If you go over to TJ Maxx or Marshalls, they're like $39. So somewhere in there is that disposal revenue in the $39. Make sense? On the other hand, newspapers, what's the disposal revenue on those? Zip, right? The kid throws them out. It was a different America, right? You could throw stuff away. All right, send it to the recycle bin. I don't want our sustainability person yelling at me. But now, the cost of the underbuy is the sales price of the thing minus the acquisition cost, because that's essentially the money you're not making. Right? Because the kid buys the newspaper for, say, five cents and sells it for 10 cents, right? Every time someone asks for a paper, he doesn't have one, he loses five cents in this model. Now, yes, I know he doesn't really pay the five cents, but go with the model. Okay? So, in any event, we create a critical ratio, which is the cost the underbuy divided by the cost of the underbuy plus the overbuy. And we can come up with, if we pick any quantity, we can come up with a probability distribution for the critical ratio. Okay, so the ratio is the probability of getting all the paper sold if you order the optimal quantity. Okay? Now, this problem actually has a lot of uses, and I picked two out of the chapter that I worked last year. They were good. Everyone liked them. And the first one is Billy's Bakery number eight on page 265. Billy bakes bagels. And on page 265 there's a number a probability mass function with it. Okay, so on page 265, there's a more complete table. And we know they cost eight Boy, these are cheap bagels. Okay, and Billy, being entrepreneurial, has a deal with the local soup kitchen to buy them the local version of El Caldito, if you will buy him for three cents. Now, if Billy were a real sport, he'd take the loss, right? But I didn't write the problem. All right, just in case anyone was worried, <laughs> you could just say, here are the bagels to the soup kitchen, which 
often occurs where you could, they could agree to pay three cents a bagel in this case. Okay, so it asks you how many bagels should Billy bake at the start of each day. Now, 35 bagels is not a lot of bagels, right? This is less than three dozen. And hardly worth boiling water. Because, as you might know, bagels are made in part by forming the bagel and then boiling them. And then you bake them and... But, again, go with the problem. So, the first thing it asks is how many bagels? Now, if this were dozens, say up to 35 dozen, now you might be talking serious money, but we'll go with this for now. Okay, so the cost of the overbuy or the overmake is five cents, right? Eight cents to make it, three cents to the soup kitchen. C sub U. Now, if you were a real entrepreneur, what you might do is add into this the cost of anything that the person didn't buy because they didn't buy a bagel, which would make the problem more interesting but harder to follow as an example. But if you think about it, if the person walks into the bakery and buys bagels, what else are they likely to buy, right? Coffee, cream cheese, bagel bites, cake, cookies, right? So the critical ratio And then we're going to make a chart of the mass function. So we have a Q. We have little f of Q. And we have the cumulative, big F of Q. At 20, we're now at 0 0.25, 0 0.70. Critical ratio, you recall, is 0.84375. Right about here. Correct?
Okay, if you eyeball little f of q, it just sort of look like it might be a bell curve. That's b, right? Notice they're symmetric, more or less. Yeah, it's a kind of normal. So if you did it normally, probably get the same answer. Realistically, what would happen if Billy was a sport? This would become 0.08, wouldn't it, right? That would increase this slightly, and that would lower the quantity, right? I'm just pointing out, you know, it's an assumption, right? What you should get out of this relatively simplistic problem is this a big problem for Billy. Because how does he know it costs eight cents? And th three cents he can know, correct? He knows his sales price, but he really doesn't have all that good a sense of what might happen. Now, he could have gotten one of, uh, say, Dr. Viaz's methods class to do a little project in his store for free, right? And they could have come up with these probabilities. He seems to know an awful lot for somebody who's selling bagels for 35 cents, right? My point is this distribution Where's he getting this from? Well, I know, the textbook. But more seriously, if you wanted to help out, say, the bagel store in Corbett Center or the bagel store near where you live with this, you could see you could easily drive yourself where? Sort of batty, right? trying to get these numbers. Because what would you have to do? Get enough days of data that you could actually conclude there are days people buy zero and stuff like that. Any event, so our friend Billy could do the following. He could look at part C and calculate the mean and variance which is easy enough to do. As you recall from basic probability, sigma squared. Calculate sigma is 8.86. You need the Z of 0.84375 conveniently from a table. So we have 8.86 times 1.8. 01 plus 18 
get that out of my picture so you can write it down. Okay, if you're wondering where I got this from, this is your standard normal equation, except a little algebra to get n over here. We're solving for the n in a standard normal. Okay? If anything on the last page looks like something you haven't seen before, you've got to break out the province stat textbook again, right? Okay. So, 27 bagels. And you say, wow, this is really useful, huh? It could be, though. The discipline required to get the data is really important. In fact, if you've heard the term big data, you hear that a lot around IE departments these days. One of the worries people have in licensing people to develop these highly sensitive and sophisticated algorithms is the data that they're actually processing might not be all that valuable. So you can collect data cheaply now, right? All I got to do is what? Track where your mouse goes. Track clicks, right? Why else would there be on every web page, there seems to be things to click on that look vaguely interesting. It's to get you to create data for them. Now, I didn't say it was a bad thing or a good thing, right? I just said it could be misused. But if you think about it, if you were, say, bored one night and you're screwing around on the web and you click on, I don't know, 10 quarterbacks homes that are crazy type thing, what's going to happen? You're going to get lots more stuff fed out at you cheaply. So, okay, any event, let's look at needless markup also, which is number... 12. Needless markup is, of course, a famous renaming of Neiman Marcus, but they sell women's handbags that This, this obviously was some years ago. As if you've watched anyone buy an expensive bag these days, 150 bucks wouldn't even. You might be paying that locally. You wouldn't have to go to an expensive store. Okay, but in any event, we can dispose at $20 and <coughs> somebody ruined the day by saying 40 cents. Now, a few weeks ago, I mentioned uh, the Manolo Blahnik shoes story with Sex in the City and all that, and everyone who was listening sort of stared and wondered where this went. Well, same problem here. If you have the shoes for 700 bucks a pair that you bought for, say, 200 bucks a pair, that's 500 bucks going towards maintaining the store. If you don't have them, you don't sell them, right? 
And the problem, of course, is how to buy in such a way that you only buy what people buy, which is an art form in that business. Okay? But you do need good data on things. Okay, so in any event, we're selling the bags, and you could sell anywhere from 50 to 250, and this is a uniform distribution. Right? So they want to know how many to buy. Answer without the critical ratio. Cost of an overbuy is twenty-eight fifty a bag, minus the twenty dollars you sell it to wherever. trying not to extend that onto the table. And that's going to equal 1990. The cost of the underbuy can't sell it for 150. So if you underbuy, you're missing out on 121.50 each time. Correct? Another thing you do, by the way, is inspire people to think badly, which is an interesting business problem, right? If say, like, imagine the following. Someone goes in to buy the thing on, they find out on Tuesday they want it. Saturday they get over to the mall, they go to buy it, it's not there. Can you sell them something else? Tough call, right? Can they think you're an idiot who can't keep things in stock? and tell all their friends, yes. Now you have a quality problem. And if you think I'm just making this up, think about the last time you walked into a store that didn't have a lot of stuff on display and what you thought of that. Like obviously no one likes this store. They have bad taste, they don't know how to buy, and it leads to a marketing problem for my friends over in marketing. Since I'm not a marketing professor, I'll just tell you there are real costs with this that you might not be able to measure. Otherwise, car lots wouldn't have lots of cars on display with the hoods up, right? The idea is to sell selection. Okay, going back to our friend the critical ratio. Area under the curve is 0.86. And surprisingly enough, 0.86 I leads you to Oh, this was 250. 
sorry. You can buy up to 200 bags. You buy a minimum of 50. The relatively high underbuy cost drives this up, doesn't it? Okay, and B, it asks, um, if, what if it's normally distributed? The Z associated with 0.86 is a little over 1 sigma or 1.08. Same deal as last time, 150 is the mean. Seventy two bags. They ask why is this different? Answer is the variance on this guy is quite a bit higher than twenty squared. So Okay, just to throw around some real numbers, if say these bags sold for three grand a bag, which is entirely possible, now you have a different problem, right? But if you think uh, these numbers are crazy, you can test this quite easily you can get on the web and look at something called lastcall.com, which is where Neiman Marcus closes out things, and take a look at the original price of something and what you can buy it for on last call. And you might say, that's still way too much, and that's certainly a choice. But just to show you what happens with these kinds of things, when they overbuy, they're risking real money. I mean, we're talking in the millions now, right? Not 150 bucks. And sometimes when they close things out, that can be quite an impressive savings. It just depends on, you know, what is it you actually do. Another way to look at it is to take a little schematic here. We can look at the probability of a stock out during an order cycle, and that's of some interest to us. Because the only time you want to stock out is when things are not not going to be resold. It's the end of the model year. It's a great time to have a stock out, right? You have nothing left over. If you're our friend and news vendor, what's the best thing at the end of the day? Maybe one stock out experience, right? Sorry, out of papers. They have to say that 50 times, they got a problem. If they say it once, who cares? Right? You buy something else or you look on the web now, right? Get out your iPhone or Android and look accordingly, correct? Okay, so you could model 
how much safety stock to have versus and this would be a straightforward normal problem or whatever distribution you think your demand has. And again, why I would do this is it's worth something to me to have safety stock, which is a real cost, right? Safety stock, actually, I have to make or buy whatever it is I sell. That is a real cost. If I don't sell them, I have to do what with them? Throw them out or discount them, right? Or like Billy with the bagels, you could work out a deal with the soup kitchen. Or you could be a sport and just give it to the soup kitchen. However, imagine if you will, your, here's a short, shortage problem. You're going on a camping trip. You're going to be out there for a week. There are real costs associated with not bringing enough clean water or food or water cleaning products and so forth, right? And yet, there's a very real cost associated with carrying too much stuff on your back. Which led to, by the way, the famous OR problem, the knapsack pro problem. But that's not part of this class. We'll leave that to Professor Sohn and Mullen and Kammerdiner to do knapsack problems. But essentially, if you think about it, you've got a balancing act to do. You can't bring more stuff than you can carry. And as people who do long distance hiking have learned, the lighter the better, right? So you've got to carry that stuff. Same thing is going on for our friends at Raytheon. They just have a much bigger knapsack. And it's costing them money for everything they buy that they can't use. Or worse yet, the engineer changes the design and you have a whole bunch left over that you made. One way to look at it is to calculate an expected number of shortages per cycle. And our friendly author offers a shortage modeling concept. And the best way to look at that is to look at an example. So let's take a look at 513. Oil filters. So here's the deal. Cost them a buck fifty. Plus them 28% to keep the filter around. Okay, monthly demand has the characteristics. Oh, the mean is 280. And sigma 
is 77. Takes five months to get it. Wow. Must be some filter for a buck fifty, huh? The cost for a back order is twelve eighty. And away we go. What to do first? Calculate the EOQ. The carrying cost is a dollar fifty at twenty eight per cent interest. Two K Lambda over H H carrying cost a buck fifty each, twenty eight per cent interest. Over five months, demand is 280. 100 bucks to order it, the two is in the equation. Now, in the chapter, Floating around on page 280 is an example where they introduce this equation, which what this does is give you the probability, one minus the probability of a reorder.
and I can take this probability and get a z, 0.0124, let me do it this way, Now, in their friendly loss function appendix, you'll find L of 0.0124 equals 0.0044. And then As we keep moving along, we can get yet another equation. For Q sub 1, which is a reorder point, because that's what we really want to find out. One hundred is the cost, and N of R, which is sigma times LZ, turns out to be point seven five. Take the square root of that, another useless quantity. The idea that you can call up someone and say, make me 13, 24 of those is going where? You'll get whatever they sell, right? If it's by the dozen, you'll get that many dozen. But nonetheless, in the world of college, we can do that. Now, you can keep testing these quantities. Because what is this doing? You wonder. Hey, these guys are throwing equations up there, right? It says they're in the book. I don't believe him. Well, the answer to that is yes, they are in the book. <laughs> On page oh, 279, 280 or so. And what are we really trying to do is the obvious question. The answer is we have an economic order quantity here, right? That we're all cool with now. I could calculate a reorder point. that's slightly higher, right? And I just did that. Now I could keep screwing around with this and come up with some optimal quantity ranges and do what? Still gonna order what? However many they'll ship you. But ideally, if somebody says, well, we, here's the real thing. If somebody says demand's 280 a month and you're looking at a five month lead time, you need to order how many? Five times 280. That is, however, potentially A, not enough, or B, way too much, right? 
So what we're really trying to do is to do what? Give ourselves a little breathing room on that, right? Because obviously if the economic order quantity is 1265 and the potential use is 3380 or more, I'm placing a number of orders, correct? And now what would I like to know? What's a good reorder point, right? I, at what point should I place an order for more? Like if there's 1,265 left, answer, bad idea, right? Potential stock out. When there's 3,000 left, answer, spend a lot of money on inventory. So ideally, if I keep going with this, what could I do? I could come up with some limits on when to think about ordering. Now that makes sense, right? Think about it. I'm using ordering 1265 at a time in theory. At what point do I actually place that order? Is the question. Draw a picture. My initial order is, say, 1265, right? And then over this five-month period, I have how many reorder points? Don't know, right? But what is useful to know is you can't let it go to zero, right? Because if you do that, you start incurring back order costs. Plus, you have angry customers out there. That you can picture, right? Now, the question is, essentially, And the answer actually is you can sort of look at a reorder function, which is what I was just doing. You should try to look at what the probability distribution tells you about where to reorder. So at that point, Say we could keep going and get some slightly different numbers, and, but fundamentally the reorder points right around 1325, which turns out to be
we can calculate this and do what? We could say mu get get ourselves the mean of that distribution, which is right around fourteen hundred. Because the standard deviation is over five months, radical n months times 77. So what might I do? Eh reorder at about 1800. That gives me some slack. And that does what for me? Keeps me from having a stock out without incurring the costs of a back order. Now, a useful question might be how many people actually do this? The answer is they might do it more intuitively than explicitly. Because who has a demand function? You need a lot of data for that, right? But on the other hand, if you think about it, if you observe, for example, um, some TV mom doing a scene in the kitchen, what are they doing? They're assessing, they're doing what? Looking at what's in stock, what the potential for a stock out is, right? On the other hand, if you catch a rerun of home improvement, Tim is always going down at a hardware store, which incurs the cost of going to a hardware store plus the time he spends plus, 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 which makes for an entertaining TV show. But it's like um, anyone that's done some home improvements might rate a job by how many trips to Home Depot or Lowe's are required to get the thing done, right? And I see a few smiles out there, so I know people know exactly what I mean, because you're out of this. You're, you discover the epoxy has set solid, you got to go buy more, right? Roughly what this is doing is eliminating that on a mass scale, right? So if you think about people buying hardware or handbags or shoes or whatever, if you're in the main department store, it's expensive to be out of stock. If you're at Marshall's, well, that's what they do, right? Different market segment. We're out of time. I'll see you again next time. Have a good day.